Hi, I'm Ron Matson, and welcome to Learn the Bible in 24 Hours with Dr. Chuck Missler. Chuck will be taking you through some interesting oversights of the Bible and showing you some amazing facts. For more information on how you can join this group, click here. Well, we are beginning hour 20 of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. And in this hour, we're going to focus on what are called the Hebrew Christian epistles. Or putting it another way, if you take the 13 Paul wrote, the ones that are left up to the book of Revelation are the ones we're now going to focus on. And they include the, the epistle to the Hebrews, epistle of James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. And uh, now, the Hebrew Christian epistles are distinctive in that not one of them is addressed to a church, interestingly enough. And what's also disturbing to many is that some of the warnings we find in these epistles seem to be in contrast to some of the assurances that we received in the church epistles. You look at Romans 8 and you compare that with Hebrews 6 and 10, it can raise some questions. You take Ephesians 2 and Philippians 1 and compare that with 2 Peter 1 and it raises questions. So those are great discussion opportunities. But do understand that there really is no con uh, a conflict between them. It may just seem that way on the surface. And whenever you think you found a contradiction or a conflict, praise God. Because it, the, God will always reward the diligent. You get in behind that and you'll come out much better understood. But um, some of these are widely misunderstood, and uh, but they aren't. There's not a retrograde here. Some people say, "Well, f you know, that James was a rebuttal to Paul." No, James written before Paul was, and it's not at all. It just it reaches beyond. It goes in a different direction. So let's take with the, Let's start with the Epistle of the Hebrews. This is one of the two greatest theological treatises in the New Testament. The first one being Romans, which we spent an entire hour on. We won't do that here with Hebrews, but we will focus on its distinctives, some of its distinctives. One thing you need to realize, Israel is not a subset of the nations, but a contrast and a focus. If you think of Israel and then all the nations as two in balance, you're closer to the perspective here. The epistle to the Hebrews stands as sort of the Leviticus of the New Testament. Basically it's going to argue that Christ supersedes and fulfills all the elements of the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood under Moses under, and so forth. Something else you need to understand when you're reading the book of Hebrews, you need to visualize yourself as a Jewish Christian that had come to Christ during the first 70 years of, the, uh, of this uh, Time. In other words, the temple is still standing. Try to understand the peculiar predicament of a Jewish believer while the temple was still operating. You see, if you were imagine yourself a Jew that has accepted Christ, but you now realize that you've previously been in, in a divinely appointed religion with divinely appointed priests officiating in a divinely appointed temple and accomplishing a divinely ordered serp, uh, service that had been ennobled through centuries. That's what you've given up. And you have to ask yourself, how could believing priests and Pharisees remain zealous of the law? You see, it was the Jewish religious world that crucified Christ and was presently repudiating Him. Understand the strange predicament. Realize that the persecutions during that first century didn't come from the Romans. It came from the Jewish leadership. So I understand that. The church in Jerusalem had already lost Stephen. He was stoned. Probably illegally, obviously, but he's still stoned. James, the leader of the church, had been killed in 62 AD. Executed. And of course there are many others. The churches in Galatia, all up north, all through Galatia, were in the same turmoil, being attacked by the local Jewish authorities. So as a result, many of these believers, Jewish believers, were tempted to go back temporarily to Judaism to avoid persecution. 
under the mindset, gee, I'll, 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 I'll stick with this so I don't get persecuted, and at the last minute I'll turn. You know, that's sort of the, you know, you, you, you get the idea. The author of the book of Hebrews, now I happen to believe it was Paul, so I may misspeak. I'm going to try not to do that because that's prejudicial. There are some good scholars that think it was somebody other than Paul. I have my reasons, uh, and I think the majority of them think that Paul wrote it. But I'll try to refer to the author rather than Paul. But in any case, he's trying to combat possible apostasy by these believers. He wants to encourage them, rather than to go back to Judaism, to press on to spiritual maturity. He wants to comfort them in their persecutions, of course. And his method is to emphasize the superiority of the Messiah specifically against the three pillars of Judaism, which were the angels, that's a big deal in Judaism, the whole role of Moses, and of course the Levitical priesthood under Aaron. These are three places that he specifically points out that the Messiah eclipses all of these. And uh, he builds very, very, you also have to understand if it was Paul, he wouldn't sign it because he doesn't want to make that the issue. He doesn't set himself up as an apostle. He's simply arguing from the Jewish scriptures the way a rabbi would. This thing stands or falls on its rabbinical logic. He's going to deviate from his logical discussions on five occasions to issue special warnings. But once you recognize those warnings are there, the rest follows very, very logically. He first of all points out that Jesus is a new and better deliverer. The God-man is better than the angels. Angels are still just angels. And uh, he's an apostle, Jesus is an apostle better than Moses. Even as highly venerated as Moses was, the Messiah is higher. He's a leader better than Joshua. In fact, he's the one that fought the battle of Jericho, if you read the last few verses of Joshua 5 carefully. And Jesus is a priest better than Aaron. He's going to explain why in, in great detail. He talks about Calvary as being a better and newer covenant. It offers better promises, offers, has a better sanctuary, it's sealed by a better sacrifice, and achieves far better results. He hits each one of these as a, in, in a rabbinical style. And so our faith should be a true and better response. And then he has parting words to the whole thing. See, uh, he, he, the Son of God is the final revealer. He's the heir of all things himself. Through the Son were all the ages made. He's the brightness of God's glory. This is in some respects similar to Colossians, except here he's not arguing to a Gentile, he's arguing in, in Jewish terms. He is the brightness of God's glory, he's the image of the Father, he upholds all things by his power, he made a purification of sin. He didn't just cover it for a while like the Old Testament sacrifice did, he made purification for it. And he finally sits down on majesty on high. So this is, in other words, in each dimension here is it's, is, it is as good as it gets. The Son is superior to the angels. How? By virtue of His deity, first of all, He created them in the first place. By virtue of His humanity. Now that may surprise you. But you see, the earth was given to Adam. So in that sense, Adam was even the Lord of the angels, was superior to the angels, but He forfeited it to Satan. But Christ is getting that back on our behalf. It had to be a kinsman of man to take over the earth. That's why Jesus called the kinsman redeemer. Just being God wasn't enough. He had to be a kinsman of Adam to fulfill the situation. So humanity is crucial here. The vir by virtue of salvation he provided. None other provides salvation the way Jesus Christ does. That's a, no, angel, no angel can provide salvation. The son superior by virtue of his deity. His position is unique. He's the head of the Davidic covenant. Angels worship the Son. He's the Son, according to, you know, that's a quote from Psalm 97. Angels serve the Son, according to Psalm 104. The Son is to rule the kingdom in Psalm 45. So he, it's interesting how often he draws upon the Psalms, not just as a hymnal, but as authority. And that's again to, that's something a Jew would accept. And of course the Son is the creator, according to Psalm 102. These are quotes from Psalms, not from the Torah. And the Son is enthroned on the right hand of God, according to Psalm 110. And so with the exception of the Davidic covenant in the second list here, all of these are so, uh, quotes from Psalms. Son superior, his humanity makes that point. See, he has sovereignty over the earth, was promised to man, not the angels. And God gave man dominion over the earth, and a man rules it. Satan does now, but a man will. Man lost it through sin to Satan and his angels. The Messiah regained dominion for man. And man will be associated with him, the Messiah, in ruling it. 
And of course, his superior over uh, salvation. He, he, why? To manifest divine grace. And he quotes Psalm 22 and Isaiah 8. To overcome the prince of death, to free the believer from the fear of death, and to help man. The son is greater than Moses, of course. But you have to, to understand the logic, you have to understand how a Jew viewed Moses. But the son is greater because of his person and work, his position. And then he inserts a warning against disobedience. And he points out how they failed at Kadesh Barnea. Remember, they didn't, they didn't, God had given them the land, they failed to take it and had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The very people God rescued from Egypt blew it because they didn't enter into that which God had provided. And he's drawing a parallel here. That's exactly the mistake they're making in the book of Hebrews, is that they have been saved, but they're not entering into the benefit of their salvation. He points out that, the, that Jesus is a priest, but not after Aaron, which was temporary. He's after a permanent priesthood. He's got a better position. It's heavenly rather than earthly. He's a better priest because he's divinely appointed. And so again, he puts a warning there, progress to maturity. And uh, re returning to Judaism is not an option. That's, what, that's an option denied. We're going to see. He says there's a need for pro progression. You need to advance, you guys, beyond first principles. Repentance from dead works, commitment to the Messiahship, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment in the great right throne. These are issues that far transcend anything Judaism can offer. These people need to be settled in their hearts once and for all to advance to maturity. See, they're, they're saved, but they're not prog progressing. They're dealing with milk, not the meat, so to speak. There is an option that is denied them. See, I understand, first of all, I believe they were saved believers. There's some people try to argue, well, because some other problem, they say, well, these guys really weren't saved. No, they were once enlightened. They tasted of the heavenly gift. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of God. They tasted the powers of the age to come. These are fright quotes. No, these were saved, but they were considering apostatizing. The option they do not have is to temporarily give up their salvation, go back to Judaism until the persecution subsides, and then be saved later. Okay? There are many people with that mentality even today in a, in a, in a different sense. See, there are only two options available. Either go back to Judaism, confirming their immaturity, and be subject to the judgment of 70 AD, physical death now, and loss of rewards later, whatever. Or make their clean break from Judaism once and for all and press on to maturity. And then today, it does not mean they have to give up observing the feasts and so forth, but they don't do it under the law, they do it as a celebration. In the same way that you and I might choose to uh, observe the Sabbath, the uh, Shabbat. Not under the law, but just to, to celebrate it and, to, take, and to, be, to glean its benefits. The responsibility of a believer to produce works which accompany salvation. You're not saved by works, but you have an obligation to have works that demonstrate, manifest your salvation. And he takes examples from nature. Rain falls upon all the earth. Some produce fruit, some does not, just like believers. Fruitfulness will be rewarded. Fruitlessness will be judged. Thorns and thistles are burned, but the land isn't, is the point he's making in 1 Corinthians 3 and elsewhere, and so it's similar to 3 and so forth. He talks a lot, chapter 7, about the priesthood of this strange character called Melchizedek that we were introduced in Genesis 14. Melchizedek, that we count, there was a priest and a king. That's different than the Mosaic world. Under Moses, the Levites were priests. Under Judah, it was the royal. They never mixed. And... Uh, also, Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham. And here the writer makes a very strange kind of logic. You need to follow his logic. Levi had not been born yet. But he regards Levi, since he was in the loins of Abraham, as giving tithes also to Melchizedek. Since Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, that Mel Melchizedek was higher than Abraham. Levi hadn't been born yet, so he was even more junior. The point he's making is that it was as if Levi is subordinate to Melchizedek because his great-great-great-grandfather gave tithes to Melchizedek. You see, he's creating a hierarchy here. Also, Melchizedek has no genealogy. It doesn't mean he was, uh, didn't have a birth and death. It just means it's not recorded. It means there's, he, his position was independent of any genealogy. And he's timeless. He had no beginning or end recording. That's the point they're making in terms of the, the, uh, being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, so, and of course Melchizedek was all inclusive. He wasn't a Jew, he wasn't a priest just to the Jews. He's a priest and king, period. 
And so it's a much broader concept. And uh, so, uh, so he, Melchizedek, in a sense, is a type or a foreshadowing of the Son of God. Now he's only a type. Uh, some people say he was Shem, but that's not true because we know genealogies of Shem's genealogy. Some people feel it was, it was an Old Testament appearance of Christ himself. No, it says in the scripture he was a man. And this is pre-incarnation, so, so uh, for what it's worth. Now, those are just interesting side issues. The main point is, is that Melchizedekian priesthood will replace the priesthood of Aaron. The Levitical priesthood could never achieve perfection. It was given for a purpose, but it could never achieve per- perfection. Another order would occur that Dave predict, David predicted in Psalm 110, another order which is non-Levitical. He's pointing out that Melchizedek is a higher order than Levi. The Le- Levitical priesthood that the Jews are committed to was temporary. And um, it was weak. It could not impart strength to fulfill its demands. And it could not bring perfection. It could offer remedies for having failed the law, but it couldn't give you the power to overcome, to, to, to keep the law. So we've got a better covenant. The Mosaic covenant was destined to be replaced by a superior one, according to Jeremiah 31. And the new covenant has better promises, better priesthood, better sanctuary, better sacrifice. Now, that's really, we really have the old covenant, called, what we call the Old Testament. The word testament and covenant is a little misleading, because we think of testament differently, but it's like old covenant, new covenant. The new testament is really the new covenant, if you will. A better sanctuary. See, the limitation of the old sanctuary, which was restricted and representative copy, was contrasted with the heavenly actual. He points out it was just a model that was given to Moses as a temporary uh, thing. Only one man out of one tribe, out of one nation, and one race could enter and only on one day in the year, and not without blood. So the access there was a very, very restrictive one. Okay? It was temporary, it was limited, it was inadequate. And the mosaic was inadequate, required rep- repetition. Animal blood, sins were, not, sins were covered, not removed. That was a, was a temporary measure pointing to Calvary. Only obedience brings perfection, according to Psalm 40. And only the Messiah can impart the perfection. Mosaic sacrifices were never intended to be permanent. So there's a lot of contrast here between the Levitical priests and the Messiah. The Levitical had many priests, the Messiah has one. The Levitical priests were always standing, there were no chairs inside the tabernacle. The Messiah is sitting, he's finished. The Levitical priests ministered daily, the Messiah administered on one specific day. The Levitical priests had to repeat it all, Christ did it once and for all, once and for all, to tell us die, it is finished. The Levitical priest did many sacrifices, the Messiah did just one himself. The Levitical priests were temporary, the Messiah is permanent. So those are the contrasts that the writer establishes in his letter. One covered the sins, the other actually took the sins away, put an end of sins. And then he gets into, in chapter 10, the danger of willful sin. See, if they now apostatize from the faith and once and for all return to Judaism, there remains no more sacrifice for their sin. That's a heavy argument that's made in, in Hebrews 10. Why? Because it's a rejection of the work of the Trinity, not just the Holy Spirit, all three of them. God will judge His people. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God in the, is the, 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 that he emphasizes. Well, having gone through all that in chapter 10, we now get to this incredible chapter, the Hall of Faith. You remember Romans chapter 8, what a high point that was? The equivalent in Hebrews is chapter 11, called the Hall of Faith, where it speaks about Abel. Uh, whose blood, uh, you know, he gave an offering with blood, which is the only way the offering was acceptable. Then we have Enoch, who had faith through fellowship. He didn't, he had, his fellowship was so close he didn't die. God took him. And then we had Noah, who was obedient and thus saved his family. Every one of us, our descendants, we all have a common ancestor. It's not Adam, it's Noah. <laughs> and then, of course, Abraham. And uh, de- he departed from his home ground, a foreigner, and uh, he, he, uh, has a miraculous birth of Isaac, and it's his belief in the resurrection of Isaac that uh, saves him. And uh, his willingness to sacrifice Isaac convinced God that he was. And then, of course, we had Sarah um, and uh, Isaac and uh, uh, all the prophecies, and Jacob, uh, who, and, the, uh, and then we have Joseph and his two sons. It goes, it goes through these great, we call it the Hall of Faith, all the way through here. And then, of course, Moses, and uh, who... Uh, uh, was hidden from the laws of Pharaoh and um, refused to be called a son, uh, the son of uh, 
Pharaoh's daughter and so forth. And they kept the first Passover, you know the story in Exodus. And we go through Joshua and Rahab and Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. It goes through this whole lineup. But let's just, as it's good, we get to about verse 33, just give you a flavor of it. As he, he stops dealing with them individually, he starts dealing with them. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Who's he talking about? Daniel, you betcha. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness that were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. It's understood that... Uh, Isaiah was sawn in half by Manasseh with a wooden saw. They were tempted, they were slain by, with a the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that without us, Excuse me, that they without us should not be made perfect. What a climax. See, all after all that, they received not the promise, God having provided something, some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made complete. Or per perfect in the sense of being completed. So having said that, after a big sweep of Romans 11, I mean Hebrews 11, we now get to Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we have five warnings in this epistle, danger of drifting, disobedience, uh, not progressing towards maturity, willful sin. And then a warning against indifference. And uh, okay, so remember I said there were three epistles that uh, amplify Habakkuk 2.4. Romans is explains who the, you know, the Rome, Habakkuk 2.4 saying the just shall live by faith. The just is defined by Romans. How shall they live? That's Galatians. By faith, the book of Hebrews. All, that verse is quoted as the cornerstone of all three of those epistles. So it's kind of interesting, I think. So, all right. Now we get to the epistle that's Yaakov's letter to the twelve tribes. And maybe say, what on earth are you talking about, Chuck? See, you don't know him by the name of Yaakov. The Hebrew Yaakov, which is the Greek Iacobus, English Jacob, or sometimes James. You know it as the epistle of James, but he, he, it was, uh, his name was Yaakov. He was, one of, he was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. And, um, um, and, uh, and, and by the way, uh, we know that uh, a lot about him. He was half brother of Jesus. He he was married. I'll come back to that. Um, he was an unbeliever during the lifetime of Jesus. He became a believer after the resurrection, according to First Corinthians fifteen. He was married in First Corinthians nine. Uh, Paul is arguing that it's okay to be married. James was, and Peter was. Okay, it's interesting. There are people that try to say Jesus was married, and they just don't know their Bible. Because for a lot of reasons that doesn't make sense, but not the least of which, if he was married, Paul would have made that argument in 1 Corinthians 9. But in any case, I won't go down that path here. That's another whole other discussion. But uh, he, uh, Yaakov, or James, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And uh, it's interesting, when Peter was released from prison, he instructed them to tell James. That was his main concern. James is the one that issued the verdict of the Jerusalem council. He also gave the proclamation that authorized Gentile Christianity, so to speak. Paul reported to him when he arrived in Jerusalem. His name was used without permission by the Judaizers that is taken task in Galatians 2. He was finally executed in 62 AD, which is interesting that that is not mentioned by any of the other epistles, and it should have been, which means that they were all written before 62 AD. It's a very interesting argument for the early authorship of those letters. There also, there's also documentation and technology that su supports an even earlier dating, but let's go on here. So um, the epistle of Jacob, and it's written to the 12 tribes of the, dis of the dispersion. 
Which is interesting. There are not ten lost tribes. That's a myth. There are people that build uh, castles on that house of cards. Um, they argue that uh, the northern kingdom was taken captive by Assyria. Well, that's they haven't read Second Chronicles 11 very carefully, but the point is um, in the south you had Simeon, Benjamin, and Judah. And the Levites moved to the south when the Civil War took place. So you now got four of the twelve in the south anyway. So if there's any lost tribes it would be eight, not ten. But that's misunderstanding the whole passage. So both Jacob and Second Peter, or First Peter, uh, address themselves to the to the twelve tribes, and the epistle of James focuses on conduct, not creed; behavior, not belief; deeds, not doctrine. So it's not a, a, a against Paul. It's just focusing on a different uh, uh, approach. It's not creed, belief, or doctrine. It's conduct, behavior, and deeds. That's his emphasis, and uh, so he says the, that the faith should be manifested by. Um, uh, by outward signs. And there's tests for the genuous faith. The response to the Word of God, response to social distinctions, production of good works, the exercise of self-control, the reaction to worldliness, the resort to prayer in all circumstances. If you have faith, that it will manifest itself in these external signs. You don't do the external signs in lieu of faith, they should be a result of your faith. And the summary of the whole epistle is in, Ch- in James 2. It says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Think believe is a big deal? It's the devils believe. Where do they sit? But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? I have to tell you, I'm, always, I'm amused by Rich Mullins' song. He says, faith without works is as useless as a screen door on a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> So, by the way, you know where a headlight is on? You know where the headlight is on a submarine? Anyone know? Well, come on, it's in the head, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to pull it out of you, buddy. Okay. Let's go to the first epistle of Peter. This is also written to the sojourners of the dispersion, to the Jews that are dispersed, the 12 tribes. And it focuses on the status of the believer, the fact that there was, by the foreknowledge of God, it's unto obedience of faith, that we are a living stone. And uh, this whole idea of a stock of, uh, a, a stone of, stumbling, a rock of offense. Um, it's interesting that uh, these idioms are used throughout the Scripture with great cons- uh, consistency. We call that the law of uh, expositional constancy. That's just a fancy word for saying that these idioms are used by the Holy Spirit, whether it's by Moses or in the Psalms or New Testament, you'll discover there's a, there's a consistency of idiomatic usage that is a testimony to its uh, source, if you will. And uh, uh, Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 10, the rock that followed him in the wilderness was Christ. He's speaking idiomatically, of course. But anyway, Peter co- talks about the pilgrim life, that we are citizens, servants, and he speaks of marriage and all of that. And the fiery trial that's coming at the end, he deals with in, in his final farewells. One of the things about this epistle, it was written from Babylon. Now there are many people, there's a lot of guys written books, they assume Babylon was a code name for Rome. That's nonsense. You may recall that when the Jews were released from Babylon, only 50,000 went under Ezra to to rebuild uh, the temple and so forth. Most of them stayed there. They were comfortable. uh, In Babylon was the highest concentration of Jews outside the land of Israel when the temple fell down. It came down. And uh, so it was the center of Judaism outside the land. It was appropriate for Peter, who was the apostle to the Jews, to make that his base. He wrote from there. And uh, there are a number of people that have, a, have an equity in trying to make Peter the first pope and all that. I won't go down that path. Clearly he wrote from, uh, from Babylon. And uh, the Babylonian Talmud, several centuries later, was developed there in Babylon. And uh, so uh, Peter, the apostle of the circumcision, would naturally base his there. You realize Paul was designated the, the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the principal apostle to the Jews. And let's get to the second letter. Uh, he emphasized the need to grow in virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, kindness, and love. Uh, and that's he also uses more sure word of prophecy that we dealt uh, with in uh, the earlier hour. How more, how sure are we, and so forth. But he also focused on false teachers that will infect and slander and uh, produce immorality. And uh, God will deliver them to or from judgment. And he uses interesting examples, the fallen angels versus Noah and his family from Genesis 6, 
and Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and his family. These two idioms Peter will use, and they're also, I mean, use, and they're also the two idioms that Jude will use when we get to his epistle shortly. But one of the things about the second epistle of Peter, he also talks about the second coming. How the belief in the second coming will be disparaged in the end times. And boy, do we see that today. It's, uh, he says uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You know how interesting it is that today so many churches fail to really focus on the second coming of Christ. And they, were, you know, they, they, they seem to disparage the study of prophecy. Uh, I have found through the 50 years of study and experience that a, a focus on prophecy invariably ends up galvanizing people to take things seriously. Yes, there are abuses. Prophecy suffers from its enthusiasts as well as its detractors. However, the, uh, the promise of His coming, it's our blessed hope. But Peter in this, in verse 4 here, adds something that's kind of a surprise. He links the concept of second coming with the idea that the creation continues as it always had. And uh, see, both ideas uh, imply the, of God intervening in man's world. And uh, many people are uncomfortable with that. So it's interesting. It's not obvious until you think it through that the, pro- the interest in prophecy is linked to the interest in the creation and, and the refutation of evolution and so forth. But he goes on and says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. So he's talking about the end times. However, the word unto is not implied in the original Greek. The word hasting is the word that is not hastening unto, hastening the coming of the day of God. In fact, in the NIV it says speed is coming, and the NAS, New American Standard, it says hastening the coming. In other words, looking for and hastening the coming. Speeding up the coming. Really? Did you know you can speed up the coming of Jesus Christ? That's what it says. How do you do that? Well, by longing for His appearing, according to 2 Timothy 4, 8. By praying for His appearing, Revelation 22, 8. And by seeking to win souls, in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. That's our mission. That's our job. As we survey the landscape of the coming year, and realize it's likely to be a very turbulent year. Let's remember that God is still in control. His church is still precious. And we have, still have the same mission. And uh, we should keep at it. We should keep at it. Because victory is assured to us. That's really what it's all about. Well, then we get to the first epistle of John. It's called his first epistle. There are many scholars think it's more a set of sermon notes than an actual letter. Although it was a letter, of course. And John, very typically, is full of sevens. Seven contrasts. Uh, truth versus error, light versus darkness, Father versus the world, Christ versus the Antichrist, good works versus evil works, the Holy Spirit versus error, love versus pious pretense, God born versus others. So this is John, whether it's his, whether it's his gospel or whether it's his letters or whether it's the book of Revelation. He's a, you always see the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure. There are seven tests of profession, desire, doctrine, conduct, discernment, motive, and new birth in the, in the uh, first ep- epistle of John. It has uh, seven traits of being born again. It has seven reasons why this epistle was written. It has seven tests of the Christian genuineness. Seven tests of honesty and reality. There are also six liars embraced in that, interestingly enough. One less than seven. And uh, so the structure is there. Whether it's the Holy Spirit or John Style, I'll leave it up to you to sort that through. There's sevens everywhere. The spiritual fundamentals, they're all inclusive commandments. We believe on Jesus Christ And that's why we love one another. That's John's emphasis. That's the ultimate test of your maturity in Christ is do you love one another? You should have a profession for others. The father sacrificing a son was love's last word. The perfect love casteth out fear and so forth. Well, it's it's a great letter. It's really the letter you want to study carefully, but I'll leave that to you. Let's go to his second letter, which is widely, in my opinion, misunderstood. I'm going to share some things with you that I cannot find anybody that agrees with me. If, uh, the second epistle of John was written to someone called the elect lady, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but, also, but all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. And he goes on. The question is, who is the elect lady? If you search the libraries, whether it's back to Jerome in the past, 
or as recently as, say, J. Vernon McGee or some of the current writers, they all will say, all of them, I've checked, say essentially the same thing. This is either an idiom, the elect lady represents the church, it's an idiom for the church, is commonly taught, or it's some prominent person in the church of Ephesus that we'll never know who it is. And that's what Jerome thought. Now Jerome was from the medieval church, the predecessor of the Catholic situation. So for him to consider this an idiom of the church may be comfortable for him, but not for us. We are not children of the church. And uh, the, unto the elect lady and her children. We're not children of the church. It's not, it's not, it's not, I don't buy that. That's just not inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. Well, the alternative is that it's some prominent person we can never know. Well, when I read the first verse, it tells me who she is, and I'm astonished that nobody else seems to see that. So I'm warning, I'm, I'm show, what I'm about to show you, I want to be candid with you, I can't, I have so far not found any of the classical commentators that agree with me. But I have found people when I show this to them that agree with me when I show them. Look what it says. The elder, that's John of course, unto the elect lady, who is the most elect person on the planet earth? Huh? Who? Mary, absolutely. The dream of every woman, every Jewish woman, was to be the mother of the Messiah. She's the most elect lady on the planet earth. Unto the elect lady and her children. Did you have children? Absolutely. And by the way, the last verse of this letter will say, the sister of your, the, the children of your sister greet you. Did she have a sister? Yes. Her sister was with her at the foot of the cross, according to John 19. We'll come to that in a minute. The el- read, just read the first sentence. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, but not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. You realize what that's saying? Everybody that has known the truth loves her. How could they? They don't know her. But if she's Mary, everybody would feel they do. Now, you follow me what I'm saying? And he's using the truth here, by the way, it'll become clear as you read the next few verses. He's using the truth as the title of Jesus Christ, by the way. But you don't have to hang on that. The elder and the elect lady are children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but all they that have known the truth love her. So that, that transcends centuries, that transcends the geography. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, see that's Christ, and shall be with us forever. Amen. The elect lady. And so all they that have known the truth have known her. In fact, love her. You see, we have a problem. The, uh, we, we, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has gone so far the other way to, to deify her, and as Protestants we tend to go the other way. We tend to ignore her completely. The truth is obviously somewhere in between. Obviously she's elect, but if, if, this, if, my, if, if I understand this correctly, this letter gives us a lot of insights. Who is the most elect lady and woman in Mary? To whom did Jesus consign the care of his mother? John. It's amazing. He didn't consign her to his other son. To, she had other sons. James and Jude and, and others. There were, you know, there were apparently uh, four guys and uh, several sisters. They did, he didn't, Jesus did not consign Mary to any of his half-brothers. She consigned to the Apostle John. Interesting. And uh, whom I love the truth, also they have known the truth. That which we had from the beginning, he says. So they people who, uh, you know, had loved her, loved her from the beginning. And she did have a sister, according to John 19.25. Now, if this is true, let's un- lo- notice some things. Mary was frustrated with Jesus when he was 12 years old. Remember, she kept those things in her heart. Remember, Jesus gave a sort of a dismissive allusion at Cana. Woman, what do I have to do with you? There's a, there's a, a that, that, that was her last recorded words, by the way, was there. Um, in Mark, she thought Jesus needed care. And of course, consigned to John. By the way, John also had a pushy mother, <laughs> according to Matthew 20, incidentally. So Mary too also needed the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 1. So here's a woman that we may venerate very highly because the mother of Jesus Christ, but she needed encouragement and she needed exhortation. Both. And that's both in this letter. This alters the tone of the whole epistle because it's written to Mary, not just to any of us. And uh, there's a divine insistence on love and the human expression of love. But also watch against error. There's a warning against false teaching. We are told by Paul to open our homes to hospitality as a way of preaching the gospel. 
She's told not to. Why? Because if she brings a false teacher under her roof, she's condoning, she's a thinner, she implicitly authorizing that teaching. She's in a different uh, uh, situation. So anyway, there's warnings in the parting comments and so forth. So I'll let you read the letter. The third epistle of John is a very short little letter to Gaius, service and truth and love, and uh, uh, Diotrephes, which had a a pride problem and some strife. But he commends Demetrius. It's a very short little note, just personal note, but it's been kept. The last epistle is the epistle of Jude. Um, This little epistle we could spend weeks on. Because, not because it's, well, it's, it, 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 not just because of its theological depth so much, as it makes allusions that just drive us up a tree. He alludes to things that he assumes his readers know that we don't know. But he, his main thrust is he tells us why we need to contend um, uh, against the apostates. He points out their, their perversions are subtle, they're destined for a certain doom. They have impious ways and their utter falsity. So his re- his, the whole thrust of the letter's goal is to nail apostasy. But then he tells us how, in the last part of the letter, to contend. What are the resources? He, why to contend is the first uh, half dozen letter, uh, verses, and then just a little letter. He points out that apostasy has been foretold, and he tells us four things to do, to build, pray, keep, and watch, and then support those who contend for the faith. But in this letter are some illusions that are just a kick. In Jude verses 6 and 7, there's only one chapter in the whole book, uh, verse 6 and 7 it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So he's making an illusion here, uh, very similar to the one that Peter does in his second letter. He talks about the, the strange goings on in Genesis chapter 6 before the flood of Noah. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. The word habitation is okaterian. That was the body, the, the body they disrobed from is the body we aspire to in a resurrection body. The same word okaterian only occurs twice in the, in the New Testament. Here, in terms of what the angels disrobed from, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, the body that we aspire to. In any case, uh, Jude says, God hath, He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So these, these particular fallen angels that engage in the mischief as Genesis 6 are here alluded to. And he goes on, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And he goes on. Second Peter has, a, has a, a passage just like this, but he even ties it to the days of Noah, interestingly enough. So here we have, uh, things are always confirmed by two or three witnesses. So we have Jude, verse 6 and 7, and we have Second Peter 2, verse 4, and there's another th- passage in Peter that support the whole view that we expressed in Genesis chapter 6. We th- I don't think that's a fringe issue. I think it's very fundamental to understand or you won't understand a great deal of what's going on in the Old Testament or prophetically. So I leave that with you. But Jude also in co- uh, quotes a prophecy that's rather astonishing. We, have no, we don't know where this came from. Jude may have... Uh, there, 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 uh, he, he, had, he had access, obviously, to sources we don't. But in verse 14 he says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He's proph- here, Enoch here is prophesying before the flood of Noah of the second coming of Christ. It's astonishing to realize. In fact, it's apparently the, the oldest prophecy uttered by a prophet. And it's of the second coming. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Seem to have a vocabulary problem there. Ungodly, ungodly is about four times. But, uh, but in any case, uh, it's a, uh, uh, interesting to realize a prophecy uttered by a prophet before the flood of Noah of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Try to be a uh, that's, 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 I think, kind of interesting. But Jude throws us another curve. What he's basically going to, uh, being ar- what he's arguing here is that we should not behave like these filthy false teachers. And one of the things that we should not 
do, that they're encouraging us to do, is we are not to speak evil of dignitaries. Even if they're our adversaries. You don't speak evil of dignities is, what he's, is the point he's trying to make. Now likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Des- they despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. They despise dominion. He, he wants order. Even if they're our enemies, we don't speak evil of dignities. Okay, so far we can, we can relate to that, right? Except Jude picks what has to be the most bizarre example to make his point. Because he gives an example here that happens to allude to something we don't know anything about, but that's not the real problem. He says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And he'll go on in a minute, but first of all, when did Michael dispute with Satan over the body of Moses? I have no idea. I have no idea. He's making an allusion here that his readers apparently knew about that we've lost somehow in, in uh, uh, there, there are some that speculate that this might have been an allusion to an apocryphal book called the, uh, the Assumption of Moses, but that's not necessarily true. But the main point he's making here, Michael, when he's in this dispute with Satan, he says, Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. What he's saying here is Michael was in some kind of tension with Satan, and even Michael, the archangel, didn't speak evil of Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And what the, the real point that, that Jude is making is we're not supposed to speak evil of dignitaries, but the dignitary he picks as an example has got to be the weirdest one of all. Satan. You're not to speak evil of Satan. You speak honestly about him. He is what he is. But you don't, you know, I tell you, you know, sometimes I attend a church and they have these songs they sing. You know, I'm so glad, Satan's so mad. You know, there's a number of these songs that are disparaging of Satan's authority. And uh, we shouldn't be intimidated by it. We shouldn't be disparaging it. Jesus Christ is in control. But when we encounter a situation, we let the Lord deal with it. We deal with it through the Lord. Very, very important fundamental point here. But uh, the book of Jude, a strange book. Well, we've gone through in this uh, survey, if I can call it that, um, um, the Pauline epistles in the, in the previous session. Romans, the, the session before that was the definitive doctrines of the church. First and Corinthians dealt with order in the church in broad terms. Galatians was law versus grace, the flesh versus spirit and all that. Ephesians was the manifestation of the mystery of the church. Very pivotal epistle in the area of ecclesiology. We really need to understand the uniqueness of the church, even among believers. It's not all believers are in the church. And we'll talk more about that in uh, the next session as we do a review of eschatology. But you'll discover many of the problems in eschatology are not eschatological problems, they're ecclesio- ecclesiology problems. And then was the, the, the epistle of the Philippians, basically our resources and suffering which has, of course, this incredible passage about the mind of Christ and so on. Then Colossians. Colossians is one of those incredible peaks that it's fun to be at the top of. Christ's preeminence. Colossians is an incredible uh, epistle if you're interested in cosmology or uh, ontology or any of these uh, high, uh, high ground. It's incredible. Thessalonians will take on next time. We didn't get into that much because I reserved it to be a, a, a to, to be analyzed very carefully when we go through the uh, uh, eschatology. The, uh, First and Second Thessalonians are probably two of the most important eschatological epistles in the in the New Testament. First and Second Timothy and Titus are basically advice to pastors, but there's much uh, there's there's there, there's not only good practical advice there. There's many insights that are there, and there's little piece of art called Philemon. You need to really a be, little brief study, but it's a del- delightful study about Onesimus and uh, what intercession is really all about. Well, and then in this session, that was the previous session, this session we went through the Hebrew Christian epistles. Hebrews was really the express document for what we would call the New Covenant. That's what Jeremiah called it. And uh, that's uh, amply dealt with, I believe, for a number of reasons. It's a, it's, it was penned by Paul who remained anonymous so that he would broaden his readership. But um, there are good scholars that have slightly different views. 
and, and uh, Jacob or James. Demonstrating your faith through works. You don't get saved by, you don't get saved by works, but you're, if you have real faith, it will show up in works. In 1 Peter 3, the persecuted church, and 2 Peter, the coming apostasy is his emphasis. And John's epistle, 1 John deserves, if there's any place that we've sort of shortchanged you, there's one place we really should have spent, we should have spent more time on John, but you can do that on your own. Just take, the, take that little epistle and dissect it, analyze it, outline it, uh, just uh, immerse in it. And 2 John, I think, has a whole different complexion if you understand who it was written to, but in any case it deals with false teachers and, and their threat. 3 John is just the preparation of helpers, a little one. And Jude is an apostasy, but has many other little nuggets in it as we've come, come from. So it's interesting, of the Hebrew Christian epistles, three of them deal with apostasy or false teachers. 2 Peter, 2 John, and Jude. Big issue and certainly clear today. We have prominent Christian people turning apostate. We need to understand that just because they're prominent and well-known people does not make them correct. You need to remember Acts 17.11, which is our trademark. You t- receive the Word of God with all openness of mind, but then you search the Scriptures day to prove where those things be so. And that's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler t- uh, tells you, check it out for yourself. And so, the seven most important epistles we haven't talked about yet. That'll come in the time after next. There are seven epistles that were written by Jesus Christ Himself. There's a second letter to Ephesus, and it's going to be very important that we understand the first letter in order to really understand the second letter, the letter written by Jesus. He wrote a letter to Smyrna, which has some similarities to Philippians, interestingly enough. He's written a letter to Pergamos, which has some similarities to Corinthians. Letter to Thyatira, letter to Sardis, letter to Thessalonica, and letter to Laodicea. These seven letters by Jesus Christ that are, constitute Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are the most important chapters in the book of Revelation. They're the ones that are most important to you and me. The, from chapter 4 on is yet future, and we'll watch that from the mezzanine. What's critical for you and I is to really understand these seven letters, and there's far more tucked away in their structure than most people have any idea. And we'll try to give you a glimpse of that when we get to the time after next. But the four that, when you study those four, I encourage you to read the Revelation 2 and 3 several times between now and the time we meet on it. But I want you to notice that the first three and the last four are distinctively different in a couple of aspects. And let you search for that, see if you can find it before we get there. That'll be your little anticipatory project. But next time, be prepared with a notebook because we're going to try to go through a review of eschatology, study of last things. Why do some people hold to a, pre-trib, a pre-millennial position, some amillennial? Most churches are amillennial. And that's a very dangerous view because it makes God a liar. We need to understand what's that all about. And given that you're premillennial, okay, great. Where, when does the rapture occur? Is it pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, whenever? Why do certain people have different views? We'll have, we won't keep our view a secret. We'll let you know how we feel. But we'll try to do it in a way that you'll be able to map different views as to how they stand on different issues. And then, of course, that'll be a prelude before jumping in to the climax of the whole thing. Everything that was started in Genesis is climax in Revelation, and we will then go there. But the next session is review eschatology, study the last things. And we'll try to t- take in, what is this rapture? What's the hypothesis? Is that a nonsense? Is that something recent? Is that, or is that serious? It's obviously the most preposterous view in Christianity, but is it true? And if that is true, what, does the church go through the tribulation? That's probably, in certain practical senses, one of the most burning issues today among Christians that are, uh, take the Bible seriously. And so we'll, try, deal, we'll deal with all of that fairly directly in the next session. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this brief opportunity to surface it, to get our arms around it, to review it. We pray, Father, that you would just increase in each of us a hunger, an appetite. We pray, Father, too, that you would lead us as to where we should go next, where we should probe more deeply. But in all these things, Father, we just pray that you would 
open our hearts and lives to your word, that we might be more fruitful stewards of these gifts you've given us. We pray, Father, that we might be growing in grace the knowledge of the Lord and Savior and that, more, and that we would be more pleasing in your sight. As we go forth and just commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.